Welcome to season two, episode six of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us today and for taking the first steps to professionalize your education and to grow personally and professionally. I would like to encourage everyone to turn on their cameras and listen with intention. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program has three main goals. One, to build entrepreneurs, to empower them to create their own business. But this is only one type of entrepreneurship. We also empower students and leaders to be innovators within a firm. An individual who creates new products, services, and creates value from ideas. We use all these different products and services, and those were once ideas before. And we need leaders within firms to guide and drive the top line revenue. And lastly, we develop individuals and empower them to, to define careers that they define themselves, not what others define for them, to create their own journey. And many students from our program have created careers that didn't exist just a few years ago. Our next guest is someone and a great example of of what we learned in class in terms of the entrepreneurial journey, the story, the trials and tribulations that one goes through in growing their business and starting it and growing it in their venture. It is this famous capitalist trope of the modern world, these experiences, how they overcome these obstacles. And I've been very fortunate to know our next guest for several years. And even through many obstacles she shared, Every conversation is full of optimism and hope. Our next guest uses her background and weaves anthropology, design, and sales to tell stories about her company and the products and the people who make them. Her business is a wonderful example of a business born global from day one. She's the owner and curator of Ethnic Origin Company. So please give a warm welcome to Petra Uren. We do this in sign language since we're mostly on mute. So Petra, first I would like to say welcome and thank you for being here this Tuesday morning. Where does this cast find you? And can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, just wanna say thank you, Steve, for having me on this um, wonderful Tuesday morning. Um, I was at first very nervous, but then I decided that it is a great opportunity to tell my story to others that uh, my struggles, you know, I wish when I started my business, I would have had this opportunity to listen to other people talk about their experiences, their failures. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, ethnic origin company, um, my baby. Uh, she was born, I call her a female, she's definitely a female, so she was born about six and a half years ago when I knew that um, I, wanted to, I wanted to do my own business. That was where the whole thing started and, um, you know, months and months of thinking, trying to figure out what I'm going to do, uh, I put down words, things, passion that I like and just one day, you know, next to a glass of wine, it was born, you know. <laughs> was there something that clicked that said, because oftentimes people might become, we have what we say, paralyzed through paralysis or analysis, paralysis through analysis. And it, there's always this fear. Did you have fear when you were thinking about starting Absolutely. a business and what that meant? Absolutely. I was working for... Um, at the time, I was working for the local newspaper, the Herald Tribune, and it was a safe job. I was making good money, but it just wasn't fulfilling, you know, but I knew I wanted to do something. And yes, I was definitely terrified to make that leap where you let go of your um, health insurance, your steady money flowing in. It is definitely a scary move, but I don't know. It was just something that was calling me. Okay. What is Ethnic Origin Company? Can you share a bit about what, what they do or what you do in, in the, 
the services and products that you offer? Absolutely. Yeah, I work with um, organizations, indigenous and tribal organizations, in right now focusing uh, on African countries and also individual traders. I import uh, handicrafts, tribal pieces, tribal art. Um, some of them are antique, some of them are vintage, some of them are new. It just depends on it depends on when I curate the pieces. I have to have the pieces grab my attention, either the story or either aesthetically or actually both. And so I import those artifacts. I have an online business right now and I cater to a global audience. So I'd like to take a moment. All the students had to take economics class, macroeconomics, and we learn about importing and exporting. Oftentimes the cases or the examples that are given are Toyota, McDonald's, these big large companies that are importing whatever, petrol oil for their companies or products that are made all over the world. But here is an example of an individual, an entrepreneur who imports and exports which is the essence of her business. So she is a one person team. I mean, of course she uses partners and hopefully she shares a bit about the role of partner partnering or networking and, and growing her business or establishing her business. But this is something that isn't something that only large companies do. In fact, it dates back to a long history of this essence of trading in our country and in many countries. So how did you get into this notion of of importing from Africa and maybe can you talk to us to the nuance because it seems so difficult or you know we're standing here in Florida and we're talking about a different continent and many countries and how do how does something happen like that um well I was born out of love I was always fascinated with uh indigenous cultures and you know, it's the internet, it's digital world, you're looking at images and pictures. And I was always one of those. I'm like, hmm, I wonder how they got that. You know, how did that get to front of people? How do you, how do you reach those sources that you want to bring in? So I've done a lot of research for months and months and months, digging through the internet and taking notes and taking notes. I mean, nights and nights after work, you know, I had a full-time job and I would go home and just take notes and try to connect the dots. How are you gonna build this enterprise? How are you gonna get to where you wanna be? So it was, it was a lot of research that went in there. Wonderful. Uh, several parts of the projects that the students have to work on is the essence of research. And this is a great example of her doing her investigation, Petra doing her investigation to work backwards like a sleuth like a, um, an investigator trying to find out how you build these contacts, make these contacts and build these relationships. And she did this through what we call primary research that she's been able to find through the internet. That's no different than what our students are expected to do in their projects. Of course, it may not be tied to sourcing, but you could see how if you have a problem and you need to work backwards to figure out how it's been solved before in other cases, other situations. So, the notion of doing research, the notion of being comfortable doing is important and essential to the entrepreneurial journey. So thank you for sharing that. I'm curious to know, you mentioned the Herald, and I think we've talked a bit about your other experiences. So the Herald, you mentioned sales. Right. But I know you've had other experiences. What other experiences, because we don't necessarily connect the dots of all our experiences um, going forward, but we can connect the dots going back. So can you share a bit about your other experiences of work and maybe how they've helped you in your venture and to tell stories or um, this woven thread? Yeah, so it's interesting that you say that. So the other night, I knowing that I'm going to have this conversation, um, I was laying in bed and I started taking notes that I was kind of traveling back, you know, in, in my own history, what are the things that I did? And I realized that all of the things that I've done in my life, it actually led me to this point because I was able to cultivate all the skills that I needed, even though at the time I didn't know that those skills were really serving me or will serve me, you know, years to come. So um, I worked at a restaurant. I was a server. And um, I realized that 
you think that it's an insignificant job, but what you really gain is customer service experience. You learn to read people, how they are, how they behave. You learn uh, facial recognition, how they're either happy, they're unhappy. So all that um, also multitasking. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys ever worked at a restaurant environment, but it's a lot of work, you know, and and you learn all those skills to pay attention to so many things, you know, and, and you don't realize that you learn these skills. So also problem solving, you know, not every customer will be happy. So there's always going to be a pushback, something that you have to deal with. And this is something that I can translate to what I'm doing currently. You know, not everybody's going to be happy. How do you make them happy? How do you turn around the situation? And then, so that was my restaurant work. I also worked at a furniture store and um, I did an interior decorating school and I decided that I wanted to become an interior designer. But then I realized that, hmm, I do not want to do that because that's just too much work. <laughs> and then I kind of went down like, I do not want to do that. But what the furniture experience taught me, also customer service, I learned spatial awareness that I really need for the aesthetic part of my business, um, style. Um, I learned how to work with numbers. I was on commission, so I had to understand numbers. I had to be able to know like, hey, what I'm selling, how much energy and effort I'm putting into one sales and what's my profit on that. So those are really interesting skills that you learn along the way. And of course, at the newspaper industry, I was in there for probably like a good nine years selling newspaper ads. And it was highly driven sales. It was go, 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 all about the dollars, all about the goals. Every single uh, week you had to make uh, cold calls, which was terrifying to me, you know, just picking up the phone and talking to random strangers. But it builds confidence. It builds confidence and you learn to understand yourself that you can take certain things personal you know it's it's all about the business so that's again another um interesting aspect and also business analysis and working with uh, a lot of the business owners that i did during my sales at the newspaper i was able to observe how they run their business you know i understood what it means to be successful business owner and how they operate were they always on time were they sending me the ads on time you know uh, the shelves are stocked you know their employees how are they being treated so it's so complex that what I learned at the newspaper is really most valuable and and you're getting paid for that wonderful so we can see here what seems like three or four different industries and not related uh experiences but each one offers many types of skills being developed or learned that help and translate to actionable skills when you're launching your own business if it's sales if it's uh, we have one of our projects olivier you should be very in tune with what uh, petra said so she mentioned the idea of reading the customer seeing their pain points understanding their experience the, this experience, if it's hospitality, if it's interior design and what they want, that's no different than building the empathy and problem solving for your end customer, which is part of the design thinking process that we teach in in um, the design thinking course that that some of the students are able to take. So thank you for sharing that. I know you also have a background in anthropology. And again, we don't necessarily attach business and anthropology or or sales and anthropology, but where does the role or your background in anthropology fall in and how does it help you in your, your business? Um, and maybe you can share an example. Right, so anthropology is my passion. It's, that's, how, that's how Ethnic Origin Company was born, out of that passion, my passion for indigenous cultures, reading and learning about different ways of living and I knew that I, I needed to do something with anthropology to be where I wanted to be. So the way it's helping me and the reason I'm actually, I, um, I'm starting grad school in um, September for anthropology, cultural anthropology. 
that it helps me deepen my understanding and knowledge of cultures to make sure that I'm serving the communities the best way, ethically and morally, the way I want to run my business. And so that is learning, even though I'm running my business, still I want to make sure that I educate myself at all times. So this is another deeper dive in terms of knowledge, of research, of that helps both you understand yourself in terms of ethically and morally, which I'm, I'm not sure how much we talk about in the business world, but nonetheless, uh, this is someone who has placed these concepts important to her business, which hopefully we utilize that and consider that and as we go forward, but also to educate her ability to share about the products that she is selling. Um, does it help play a role in storytelling? Absolutely, absolutely. And, yeah. and, and in what way? So you make that connection. You know, you make the connection that something that will end up in someone's doorstep in Alaska, um, they will understand the story when I tell the story where that specific uh, piece comes from. I'll tell them that if it was made in Zimbabwe with um, handmade indigenous group or indigenous people, had made that piece. We talked about this, one of the pieces that we talked about specifically for uh, a mortar. So there was this mortar that indigenous people use. It's it's a tribe and what they do, it's, um, it's a really rustic piece. It's a hollow piece with a, a, a pretty substantial heavy bottom. And what they do is they grind millet and, and wheat in it, you know, and this is a cultural piece, but what happened is if you flip it around, it becomes a beautiful uh, nightstand. So I've been doing really well with that because it's sustainable. And I do want to convey that message that anything that I work with, it's sustainable to make sure that uh, we take care of our environment. So that's where innovation and creative mind comes in. That one item that used to be a necessity for somebody turns into a piece that is functional for somebody in a completely different continent. This is a wonderful example because in our creativity and innovation class, and I would say all the courses, but specifically that one, we're expected to connect random ideas or what seem like not connected ideas. We're challenged to change our mental model or our perspective. And this is a, a wonderful example of how while we can look at this mortar and in one view it could be seen as a tool to make products through wheat and millet but in a totally different perspective it is now a fashionable chic nightstand that sells for a premium and we can start seeing how we can create value because i know my next question uh will talk about creating value for multiple groups of people and so you can start seeing how this creative thinking or the creative change process goes from taking this traditional millet or mortar that met use, is used for millet grinding. And now it's a beautiful nightstand in someone's home who wants a certain feel and decor and sustainable product. So this is a wonderful example of what we're assessing in our creative assessment booklet that we have for our course. So we, I want to talk about creating value or um, supporting the broader community. And I know not only is this a business that you import and sell uh, these products, but you also give back to the community through different partnerships and, and other relationships you have with the, the local. Can you share a little bit about um, how you're giving back and yeah. why you feel that's important? Because uh, more and more businesses, definitely the millennial and younger generation see entrepreneurship and innovation deeply tied to sustainability, tied to making the world better uh, and, and being more inclusive to, to everyone. So can you share a bit about what you're doing for your company and, and the local people that you're working with? Yeah, and I also wanted to add that I want to, uh, my goal is to connect communities that to understand that we're not different at all. You know, we're, we're very much the same species and we have to understand that connection, you know, telling the story. Um, so back to your question, I, one of the uh, organizations I work with, it's a church organization in Cameroon that employs, um, I do believe we're at like five or 600 uh, artisans 
many of the artisans are women, they're widowed, uh, they take care of their children on their own, you know, political turmoil that's going on in that region. And I work with them and years and years we've put together packages, make sure that all these artisans are able to support the children, they can buy uh, school supplies, they can get education. So that's a really important part for me to give back and and make sure that all the artisans are being taken care of. Um, other organizations I've supported for the past six years is called Survival International. They are the biggest movement for indigenous people's rights. There's a lot of thing going on right now. I don't know if you guys dive deep into that, um, but there's land grabbing specifically in the regions of the Amazon, also in Africa what happens to governments go in and take the land of indigenous people because those are the most fertile lands and they they want that for profit. So I want to make sure that this organization is being supported and none of these old traditions are getting lost. And then I also support Greenpeace. So here's a great example of a small business embedding it into their values, into their, their business structure, and a, a model for all of us. It's not just because you're a small business, you can't be part of a bigger solution to the challenges and the, the, that the world face, but it's something that was born from day one. And, and this is a wonderful model and role model. So thank you, Petra. I would like to prime the students. I'm gonna ask Petra another question and we're gonna have a little more discussion, but if you have questions, please begin to raise your hand. And maybe Sienna can start to moderate that going forward. We're curious to know, we talk about prices or how do you find out what a, something is worth for one of your products? Um, a lot of times my students have to do research when they're coming up with a solution for the problem, the challenges that they're working with. And it, they don't necessarily have to price it, but they certainly have to find maybe how to source it, cost, et cetera. And I'm curious to know how you go about doing that and you know, your process. Right. So that is that is actually, so you get your humanity part where you want to take care of everybody, but then you have the part where you actually have to make money because it's, it's still a business. Um, and that's the part where you do, again, a ton of research. And how you do your research is that if you see a particular product that you are in love and you think that it's going to do good, the first thing that you do, you do calculation. You go online and see who else is selling this product. Is there available anywhere else? What type of businesses are selling it? What are they selling? Are they really priced high or are they lower price? And then you calculate, you know, how much are you able to purchase it for? And then you also add the shipping cost. And then, so you try to position yourself in the market where your business want to be. So particularly in my business, I made this decision from the beginning. I didn't want to be the cheapest person in the market. I didn't want to be the person that sells the cheapest thing because that's just devalues your um, whole model, you know, your, your whole philosophy. I also didn't want to be the highest. I didn't want to be the most expensive one because that's also taking advantage of the situation. So I wanted to position my stuff somewhere in the happy medium. And all what I do is I grab like three or four different items that I uh, carry or work with and just position myself somewhere on the middle that is comfortable for me. And then that's the vision that I, I want for my company. Now, what happens if you put something out there and you it's a different expectation in the market, how does how does that work, and what do you do when you have to adjust? You adjust. You know, you have to be flexible. When you're a one go show, you have to be flexible. There's, I had examples that I had items that I had for a year and a half. It didn't sell. I was hundred percent sure it's the best thing. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It didn't sell. I had to discount it. You know, I had to discount it and let it go. And then I had the other example where I thought that it was a mediocre product. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, that's not gonna sell and it's flying off the shelves. And so you have to adjust the course when that happens because you have to listen to the market. You have to listen to your customers, what they want and 
that is part of, you know, being a business owner. And I think the advantage of being a smaller business that you're able to adjust the sales so much faster than a larger company would. Of course, they have bigger capital to back it up. But as a small business owner, you know, when you start out, you have to adjust. Um, yeah, you have to adjust. This is a wonderful example of getting feedback from the market. You know, Petra can't buy hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars worth of, of inventory and just sit on it and wait for it to sell at a certain price and a certain cost. So she has to know where she positions relative to her competitors, but at the same time, still uh, be flexible enough to adjust prices and certain expectations based off of how those have sold in the past and potentially in the future. Um, and this is about listening to your customers. And I know we have to do this, get feedback both in the scalability and innovation course and the student consulting design thinking. And this is the idea, or and even last week when we talked to our guests, this idea of a pop-up, you know, testing the market to see if there's a demand, to see what the price point could be and adjusting as you go on before uh, investing the whole house uh, for, right. to, to sell this type of product. So wonderful example. Yeah. I would like to ask the students if they may have any questions at this time um, and to think about that. But right now, before they raise their hand, entrepreneurship is sexy right now. It is cool. What is uncool that we don't talk about about entrepreneurship and innovation? You know, maybe you could share a story or? Sure. Well, I remember I was telling you that, um, and it is a small story, but I'm sure all of you will able to relate to this. Um, I was getting in a big shipment and it takes, I would say like a good five, six hours for me to go through a quality check, make sure that everything looks good and it's all received in good quality because you have to check that, that you know, that's just a given. And I wanted to do my nails because I had an event that I had to go to, but I wasn't able to do my nails. So when I couldn't even go to the event because it's just, I didn't make it there because business was more important. And sometimes you will sacrifice certain things that you think you want to do for yourself because business will take over and, and that's going to be number one. So you sometimes, even though the business is you, you can become number two instead of, you know, being on top of the list. And at times I'm still up at one o'clock in the morning and packaging and emailing clients, or I had somebody from Singapore wanted to chat that night because that's when they were up and they wanted to purchase something. So I'm not just going to go to sleep at 1230 when I'm super exhausted. And by the way, I have a full-time job also, but I had to stay up late and make sure that I close that sale. So it's a lot of work. So it sounds like, while there is this wonderful appeal of being entrepreneur, there are some serious personal sacrifices. Absolutely. I would like to open the floor for questions from our audience. They're very shy. Yeah. Except for when they have questions about their grade. <laughs> Adriana and Piero have questions. Wonderful. Uh, Adriana? Then okay, Piero. so. I don't know much about like importing and exporting business, um, but I was just curious about how you began to network and like kind of get in the door of like companies that have certain artifacts that you wanted, like how you began to interact with them and figure out which companies had like the stories that you were after that, that you wanted to share with people. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, it was a lot of emailing, a lot of phone calls, a lot of messaging people. I mean, I probably talked to hundreds of people, you know, and, and based on the feedback that I was getting back, I was able to evaluate like, mm, I don't want to work with those guys. You know, they're not the real source. And then that's the hard part sometimes to do the, uh, the market search that finding the wholesalers, finding that price point that you're able to work with, because there will be middle people, middlemen, that will also want to make money on you, but then that's not profitable for your business. So it is a lot of, lot of having conversations and it's a bit harder because I wasn't there physically. I couldn't go to like, Hey, let me just walk into, you know, Cape town or any of the African countries. And I'm like, Oh, here, here I am. You know, you can do that here locally, 
when that's the type of business you have, but with import export, it's kind of building relationships, you know, right. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the, the best selling item that I work with the church organization, um, I paid for, and this is how it went down. The first time it was a different uh, source. I paid for it and I lost the money. I never got the merchandise. Oh, wow. It just disappeared in Africa somewhere, you know, thousands of dollars. And wow. You know, it's it's one of those things. So the person that I'm working with right now, we have a really good relationship that we built for the past three years. He said, look, I'm going to ship you the first 20. And when you receive it and you're happy with the quality, then that's when you're going to send me the money. And that's how we built the relationship. And then we were going like, OK, I'll pay 50 percent down. You know, once I receive the goods, I'll pay the rest. So you have to negotiate. Like, you have to have really good negotiation skills. And don't be shy. Don't ever be shy. Because it's all okay. about you. You know, you have to know what you want. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Hi, Petra. Uh, my question was, um, how did... How did the, you will you uh, let me rephrase it because Adriana took my question to some extent. <laughs> um, how did how did you contact or have you been to those tribes? Like, have you went to Africa and met those tribes? Because like here in Peru, in the Amazon, in order to get those uh, those tribal artifacts, one needs to go. There's no middleman. Like you need to do tourism and then you buy them. So, have you ever been to to those tribes? Right. So I've been to South Africa, which is where I consolidate all my goods. And I've been to Kenya. And no, I didn't visit the tribes. There actually are traders from the tribe that they go to cities or they visit the cities, they bring their goods. And that's those are the people that I deal with. Yeah, you have to find that's the hard part to find those people. It is. It's very hard. It took me years just to find the right people that you can trust because it's the big thing is the trust you know how do you trust people like they can say whatever they want to say you know you're in peru so you know that you know trust is a huge thing i was born and raised in hungary eastern europe uh trust is not easily given you know it's something that you earn and it's the same thing in business world you know don't give your trust right away they have to prove themselves Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. What other questions might you have? These are excellent questions. Very thoughtful. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, if you were talking to a younger version of yourself, what advice would you give her? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So I actually took notes on that because I was last night. I'm like, <laughs> perfect. What did I tell myself? I did come up with some stuff. So definitely staying focused you know because when you're younger it's so easy to do there's always a shiny object you know you're just there's always something like oh that's really cool oh that's cool and then you just get off of track so easily but staying focused um avoid closed-minded people definitely surround yourself with uh people that are more open-minded um people will give you advice good or bad it's your job to distinguish between what's good for you so you just listen to your gut feeling what is a good advice in that moment um stay humble because you will always learn something from other people there's always going to be somebody that will teach you things and what else oh yeah take calculated risks you know business is about calculated risks um have to move out of your comfort zone move out of that box it, it's in that comfortable box you will not find what you're looking for you know especially that you guys are all in the entrepreneurial ship program and there's a reason why you're there you know because you're already thinking to become an entrepreneur or you have dreams or ideas and um yeah also dedication for sure and give back without expecting anything to gain from it that would be it. That was great. Thank you so much. And also, uh, Kendall has a question. 
So earlier you were talking about like the restaurant or like fast food management. How would you, I don't know if you mentioned it when you said that, but how would you compare that to like entrepreneurship? So what's in a fast food uh, management, it was mostly managing my own time. It actually it was my second job. I worked at the uh, newspaper and then when I was done at the newspaper, I would go and wait tables because I wanted to make money. I wanted to put money aside, save money for a business to have that capital that you want to invest in the business. So it's fast paced. You know, you deal with people all day long. So you learn these uh interpersonal skills which is really really important because you're dealing with people all day long and we're just people you know and you develop that that you shouldn't have fear because we're just all people you know because we get timid we get nervous around others that when we try to ask for things and and these are all situations that will teach you to just stand your ground and you know be confident on what you do Thank you. I see Adriana has another question. Yeah, I just have one more question. Um, you kind of answered a little bit, but I was just wondering how, when you first started your business, when you dealt with like negative feedback, either from friends or family that you realized didn't necessarily go out of their way to support you or shout you out, how did you deal with like, you know, that confidence drawback? Like, how did you come up from that? So this kind of goes back to um, my past when I moved to the U.S. I moved to the United States in my early 20s and I didn't speak English. And most of my family members uh, said I'm going to fail. So when people tell me that I'm going to fail, that actually is a boost of energy for me to prove them wrong. Right. That's how. Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> That's how. Don't believe. Just believe in yourself because... You are the only person by yourself that's going to be around through that journey. You know, friends, family, people will come and go, but it's only you that you need to trust in your right. gut feelings. Does that help? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We, we talk often about all the, you know, achievements that entrepreneurs make when you know, looking back, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've faced? Um, I would say money. So financial situation. I didn't have the support to start the business. So that's why I had two jobs. So I was able to put money aside because you need that. You needed to invest in merchandise. You know, that it's we're talking a lot of money to to make your first sales to, to put uh, all that money into your inventory. So my biggest challenge was, is raising the capital and, and finding that money. With all these obstacles, do you think about quitting ever? No. It, it, okay, it's never crossed your mind. Like for like a microsecond when I'm so tired at two o'clock in the morning, but then I'll just look at my beautiful things and I smile and, and I think about the people that I help and rely on me and no. Not for a second. Is there any, how do you keep learning though? So I know you're going, you mentioned you're going back for your master's. Is there a skill that you've, you've been honing to develop recently that has helped your business or, you know, learning is part of the entrepreneurial process and how do you make sure that you are continuously learning? You talked about the research you do and all these other things, but is there anything special or unique that could help us as we go through our journey? Yes, so I was actually gonna mention this because I think it's one of the most important things that helped me throughout this journey is, I call it social capital, which is the network of people, my friends. I have many, many friends who have their own businesses. And it is really, really important that you surround yourself with people, like-minded people. Because when we go out for a dinner or any activity, we talk about business. You know, we share uh, stories, we share obstacles, we share failure, we share success. And when you're able to talk to your friends honestly and openly about this, it's very helpful. Like many of the friends, I have a friend who runs, um, uh, he's a sail maker, you know, um, he's in the sailing business. And this might not directly relate to what I do, and we deal with completely different uh, businesses, 
but the business model is how you're serving the customers and, and what you sacrifice. It's, it's, a, it's something that it's a common language that we all understand. Others, you know, they have a real estate business or they have a design firm that they run. And, and it's something that you learn from these people every single day because they are in different situations and you can translate it to your own. Is this something that students can start today and tomorrow? I sh they should, they should. You know, they really should, and they should start uh, building up the community. I'm sorry, that's my dog. Hey, hey. Sorry, <laughs> it's my doggy. Um, yes, they should. They really should start building these connections right now because um, it will take you along the journey. You know, like, but, but really, I don't. I don't see connections if you just friend people on LinkedIn, which is great, but you have to get to know them personally. You know, you have to have conversations like like go out for a drink, go out to to a show and and have a really deep conversation because those are the ones that are meaningful and those are the people that you learn from and it's free advice. So one thing that I have hoped part of this community is to at least start to establish these relationships. We have a uh, very diverse background in terms of students, where they're, what major they're, they're coming from, interest, but there is no doubt overlap in their, their goals, their desires, or whatever their journey takes them. So that's one of the hopes or the goals that I have for this community. And I'm so grateful that you've been open to spending this Tuesday morning. I would like to ask the audience if they have any last questions. Um, for Petra before we say goodbye. Yes, I do have one final question. So going back to the financial obstacle, you had mentioned that you used a lot of like bootstrapping, you know, funding your company yourself. So did you, was there a point in time that you thought about having an investor or, you know, why did you decide not to use like external funding? Um, yes, to answer your question, yes, it did cross my mind. I thought about seeking out an investor um, and it didn't make sense for me. I didn't want to give that control to someone. So I wanted to keep the control in house to be able to make decisions. But yes, yes, I think I think it's it's OK. It's really OK to find an investor, but you have to be sure who, because I've heard horror stories from my friends that it was not a good relationship. So you have to make sure that, that the person that you're dealing with, everything is written down, documented. You're not being naive. You know exactly what your expectations are if you're looking for an investor. That was very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want, I want to give you the last word, Petra. Where can we find your artifacts? Where can we find more information about your company? and discover the stories that you're telling and the people that you're connecting us to. Yeah, so you can find me either on uh, Instagram, Facebook, my website, Pinterest, LinkedIn, <laughs> Etsy, Amazon, or eBay. So I think it's really important that you find the vehicles that best work for your business and just be everywhere saturate the market with your um information because you will have different people you know finding you in different ways so yeah you can google it ethnic origin company you'll you'll find it petra i can't thank you enough for spending time on your day off to share your wisdom and experience in the entrepreneurial journey that you've made uh, i'll be in touch okay let's give petra a big warm uh, welcome and thank you for your time thank you guys for listening Appreciate it. Good I'll luck. Follow up soon. Yeah. Bye. That was awesome. Hopefully you guys uh, took some good things away. I mean, this is the nitty gritty, the things that you, the, some broad concepts that you learn in, in school and you're like, when am I going to use that? Imagine she, she just told me in the past that it's taken months to get order shipment to collect the shipment months because it's coming by boat you know it's not like amazon it arrives in two days uh, no pun intended but um 
it's not like prime it's driving in two days this takes months you have to curate it, it has to be collected and then it has to be shipped over here and now if you guys know anything about what's going on with the shipping containers there's a shortage that creates rise in prices delays and you need cash flow and if you're paying 50 percent up front and even if you're getting it for free you still need product to sell so you can start seeing how this is really globalization and it's happening you know with someone that we know someone locally and something that we're we're able and capable to do so hopefully you guys took a lot away um i want to open the floor for questions you might have you